Welcome to Chinwag, my friends. Welcome, one and all. Welcome once again to another very interesting, highly detoured chat. <laughs> Highly <laughs> deeply detoured. Is that a is that a verb? Yeah, I guess it is a verb. You deeply detoured, detoured, don't you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So it's a yeah extremely detoured uh, uh, episode that we have today with the supremely talented and ingenious Sarah Vowell, who will be yeah. uh, joining us. Uh, but before that, as Steve, we should have a little banter, shouldn't we? Don't we? Do? Well, we, we should banter. We should, a little palaver, a little banter. People love banter <laughs> these days. You know what I mean? People love banter. I, when I listen to NPR now, which I occasionally do in the morning, you know, big surprise. I listen, to, I hear the uh, the sort of morning podcast. That's what I listen to sometimes. And oh. those people now have banter. Do they really like the they banter? Um, yeah, the, before they it? read the news or whatever. Yeah, they, they have like they, a little kooky banter, and I, I I don't know what I think of it, frankly. Yeah, I, I frankly I, I would like to get that <laughs> elsewhere, not on the new, not on the news. <laughs> exactly, I, I, and it's a little jarring. From yeah, I never really heard it from the Empire people. Is it like, like what'd I, you have for breakfast? Kind yes, of stuff? What, very really? much so. Very much so. It's very much kind of like and then hey, today in that, Ukraine, like yeah, no, I don't think that yeah, should be. Combined. I don't need it. Right, I don't. I definitely don't want you humanized. I don't what follows our banter is just more nonsense. And more, more nonsense. And more ba- it's more banter. banter. <laughs> it's more banter. So I feel like you're absolutely right. This is a perfect place for banter. And and what's ironic is it's very meta right now. We're bantering about banter, yes. which is really interesting. I like that. That's and we want uh, we want fans of the show to also banter to us. Nice about transition. Our nice our transition. <laughs> very, very. We want to banter with you too. Come yes. banter with us at uh, at various uh, platforms. Uh, Apple Podcasts, all kinds of things, all over. Yeah, the place. Instagram, you can find us anywhere. TikTok, YouTube. Uh, yep. The good, the great animations are on YouTube, and we've been getting uh, comments yes, on right. YouTube and Instagram, and people. Yes, write us, uh, and we get people letters. writing us, uh, emailing us uh, queries, letters. It's fantastic. Yeah, and please uh, give us a review if you're liking the show. That always helps people find yeah, the sure show. Does. So that's great. That feels good. Yeah. So, uh, so come banter with us. And now, without uh, any uh, any further ado. Uh, let's move on. Our chinwag today, we have essayist and New York Times bestselling author of seven nonfiction books on American history and culture, Sarah Vowell. Uh, books including Partly Cloudy Patriot, Assassination Vacation, a particular favorite of mine, The Wordy Shipmates. That's uh, a favorite of mine. That's the one yep, on Puritans. Great, yep, great and, book. And Lafayette and the Somewhat United States. Uh, she's also contributing editor for the radio program, This American Life. Speaking I of, think that's uh, where I first heard her, actually. Uh, me too, probably, yeah. And she's in, in the um, Pixar films, uh, Incredibles. The Incredibles, the and the Incredibles the, too. The daughter, I think. She has a fantastic voice. Uh, we're very honored to have the super smart, super funny, super talented, Sarah Val joining us today. Hello, Sarah Vowell. Hello. Hello, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to the chin wag. Welcome to our little uh, little show, our little soiree. Yeah. What the <laughs> heck am I doing here? <laughs> It's an excellent question. What the heck are any of us doing here? Yeah. Actually, it's an excellent question. So I, I know who you are, Paul. Stephen, I'm a little <laughs> less clear on your situation. I thought you would have read all my work by now. I mean, it's I, a so I did like I did it. haphazardly yeah. see that you teach at Columbia College. <laughs> Th- thank I, you for that's looking in that Chicago. up, sir. <laughs> I'm a I'm a School of the Art Institute alum oh, myself. Cool. Yeah, right, that's right. So right. Yes, down so the you street. Know. And um, what else? I thought there too. You're some kind of muso, jazz bow, something. Yes, a blues player. Oh, and blues. I, yeah, I had the good fortune to play with uh, Buddy Guy and Bo Diddley. Oh, but nice. I taught it. Uh, when were you at the School of the Art Institute? That's a great, great school. Did they have grades there? Because when I was teaching there, they <laughs> gave. They did not give grades, and I thought this isn't going to work, but it did. They did have grades. I did have one professor who had everyone give themselves a grade, grade which I thought was very art school. <laughs> yes. The really type A people didn't like that. Um, <laughs> what yeah. were you studying there? Art, what were you studying? Art history. Ah, art history. Art history. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I believe that's a Hilma off Clint behind your head, Paul. The art historian, uh, 100%. A wow. plus. Yes. Nailed it. 
A plus. Yeah. Give yourself are an you A plus. A, are you a that Hilma? A, are you? A I am Hilma a Hilma head? of Klimt. I, I I enjoy it. Do you, you are you familiar with her? You obviously a are. Steve, bit. are you yeah. familiar with Hilma of Klimt? No, I'm not. She's, she, uh, well, she's a Swedish. Uh, there we go. No, early please. Early twentieth century Swedish painter. Uh, you know, in my day, the the uh, story was that the first uh, non representational abstract paintings were Vasily Kandinsky, mm-hmm. but it turns oh. out it was Hilma beat him to the punch. Right, and there and are it, some theories that maybe Kandinsky even saw some of Hilma's work. Uh huh. Interesting. Well, they they look a little bit like that. I'd like to point out that on the other side of me is a moth trap that actually mm. looks like a Hilma of Klimt as <laughs> yeah. well. Which I didn't do that on purpose, but I'm just seeing it now, and so I yeah. hope everybody is appreciating that. I've it, just it's... blown my cover as like a folksy Montana, and, and I've <laughs> like I've gone full. No, never, not at all. No, I think no, no, no. <laughs> But but Hilma of Klimt is interesting because th- now you asked why you were here and basically it's exactly what's going on right now is why <laughs> yes, you're this here. Is like random interest. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> what's that's on your why shelves? you're here. That's why you're here. Hilma of Klimt, though, Steve, is interesting. And I actually meant to point this out the other day. She had this whole kind of mystical system. Mm. Her paintings were very oh, like they're very complicated. Kind of stuff? Yeah, but they were super her own, very private. And I believe that like a bunch of her stuff. She said people couldn't even look at it or something. She kept it sort of closed away, and, and, and people weren't even allowed to look she at it. She was or something a potentially until, mentally ill female weirdo. It's not mm-hmm. like people were beating down her door. You know, understood. That's true. Yeah. But I believe was that she still there is stuff. Was her artwork uh, sort of after she you know, died? I, I believe she tried to leave it to the Moderna Museum in Stockholm, and they didn't want it. And then she became a big right. posthumous art star, and they're right. like, hey. Can we get those back? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. (laughs) And so she's got a lot of weird, like, mystical writings. You know what jerks the Swedes are. They're horrible. They're the worst. (laughs) Out of control. (laughs) They're terrible. They're the worst. I'm a quarter Swedish myself, but. I actually have more Swedish in me than I realized recently. Mm. I found out because I did. Have you done? Uh, oh, no, did you do more, a DNA not more test? than Italian. I did. I did. I, I handed all of my DNA information over to one of those creepy companies. Mm-hmm. That's uh, and uh, a while ago when I first did it, it was interesting because it came back and I was very excited. Because have you done it, Twenty Three and Me? I did Ancestry.com okay. like more than ten years ago. I probably did it about. 10 years ago too. And it came back and when you first open it, there's a map and these parts of the right. uh, of the map are lit up that are your, your places that you're from. And fascinating for me, there was Italy and there was Germany and there was the UK and then Australia and surrounding areas, kind of Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, all of that was lit up. And they claimed for a while that I had some, you know, Way back there, seventh, eighth generation, I was some indigenous Pacific Islander, which I thought was interesting because I have Dutch ancestry. So I thought maybe somehow that happened because the Dutch were sure down there doing all kinds of fun things. Sure. But my son explained to me that this happens a lot with these things, that you get these crazy results where you have like some kind of like Siberian native yeah. Siberian person, and then it turns out you actually don't. But I don't well, quite understand. it keeps changing. Have you, right. do you like, go back and look? Like, I have. for a while there, I was I wildly have. Iberian. And uh-huh. I was like, who was sleeping with all these Spaniards? <laughs> Spanish, and then, very nice. now that's over. I also uh-huh. have a twin sister. She's way more Swedish than I am. I'm great percent <laughs> that, if, Welsh. Would She's I be able to tell Welsh. that if I just looked at the two of you that one of you was more more Swedish? Yeah, she is blonde. But okay. um yeah, I'm suddenly Welsh and she's not. So there, there's a lot of like the the data grows. The data grows and gets I think in theory refined too. And like so the last time I looked to my great disappointment, I was no longer no longer was I. Was there any indication that I was a native person of Oceania? So mm. I wasn't from you know nobody They're cleaning from, up your profile. Nobody from Vanuatu. Well, or you know, something um, like that. Pat Oswalt, who I believe you've had on your show. Yes, indeed. He, he did one of these, and he found out he was like I don't know one or two percent Mongolian, and that's you know the story on that where it's 
part of like Genghis Khan. Everybody's and his Genghis army, Khan's offspring. Armies, right. Because like <laughs> how many just... has been he has been to <laughs> Mongolia. So there's this one uh, Have you? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, have you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Okay, great. And there's this Genghis Khan building that's this enormous colossal Genghis Khan statue that's a building you can go inside. Mm-hmm. And um because they're very proud of him and his achievements, <laughs> which are you know numerous, but Legion, yeah. No you know, that reminds me though when um your colleague approached me about this. Indi- she indicated there was some sort of woo-woo aspect to this show. And as a like nonfiction <laughs> writer, I mo- mainly deal in facts. But I had this midlife crisis in my 40s where I just got really into Asia. Um, okay. <laughs> so that was part of it. That's so Central I, Asia, of course, I but that's was, I, I, um, who's to quibble? Not me. Th- that, that's East Asia. That's East <laughs> yes, Asia. It is. You're um, right. It still is. Um, so I'm in the Gobi Desert, mm-hmm. as you know. As one is. As happens. <laughs> and, uh, in your like, 40s. Luckily, I dodged a dust storm. Mm-hmm. So there was there was some time at this camp where I was staying, you know, like the in yurt. the yurts in a yurt. Mm-hmm. I was staying sure, in a yurt, yurt, of course. Absolutely. But there was yeah. like a main building where they had electricity and everything. And um, my guide said, "I want to show you this movie," and like, okay. And it's a, I guess it's a documentary. I don't know who filmed this, mm-hmm. but you know how the the Mongolians, they're nomadic and uh, their yes. uh, camels are very important to them. Ah, oh. camels. Big jerks. I don't think I knew camels was, a, jerks, was a thing huh? in Mongolia, but yes, they yeah. spit and stuff, right? So this film is of this camel giving birth. You know, like, I don't know this guide's idea of what someone's vacation was supposed to be like. <laughs> so she's sure. like, let's watch this movie of a camel giving birth. So we're doing that. <laughs> and then it's a difficult birth. So, you know, like, let's watch a video of a difficult camel birth. <laughs> and so the herder oh, has to intervene and pull the baby camel out. Baby uh, camel lives, but sure. it's been contaminated by the human herder's hands. Oh. So the mother will have nothing to do with it, oh, and geez. which means it's not going to um, nurse the baby. Right. And which is, you know, very important. So the... Once the herder f- figures out this is what's going on, this baby needs milk, and the mother is not going to give it milk because it has, you know, human cooties. And the herder <laughs> says to one of his kids, go get the music teacher. Oh, here we go. And so this kid, like, wow. I can't remember if he jumps on a horse or a moped. So <laughs> okay. I can't remember that part. But he goes into town, sure. the nearest town, yeah. and he goes to the elementary school, finds the music teacher— brings him back to the baby camel and the music teacher has this stringed instrument. I don't, uh-huh. I didn't recognize it. Plays a song. <laughs> the mother like, uh, Amazing. recognizes Whoa. the baby and nurses the baby. Amazing. Wow. Cool. That's yeah. really cool. So if that's you guys fascinating. have any idea of, what that's about. I Let have an know. explanation that you is not Steve supernatural. Steve probably will. Yeah, Steve uh, will is that have something a, yeah. you learn in the Southside Blues Clubs? <laughs> yes, this is like a big thing that Buddy, Buddy Guy and I talk about all the time, <laughs> difficult camel births. <laughs> but, but what happens is that when the, the baby is born, especially these kinds of animals, there's a huge flood of oxytocin in the mother's brain because oxytocin is involved in letting down milk and breasts and it's a neurotransmitter. And then the, there's a huge flood of I oxytocin. I love it when men the, explain the, breast milk. No, <laughs> Go on. Just, that's so just you how know, it works. Sarah, how, <laughs> so that, well, but this, this is so camel. for you. But that's that's for camels sake. we're talking about. <laughs> this is I'm explaining camels. it for other men who might be listening. Got it. <laughs> so then the baby has all this oxytocin, but the window, that and that bonds, helps the baby and the mother find each other and bond. When And for ungulates and like, you know, sheep and stuff, it's only open for about an hour. Then the oxytocin goes away, and the mother will reject any uh, baby that that it hasn't suckled within that hour. Immediately. So they've actually proven this by after the bonding window closes, they can actually directly inject oxytocin into the mother, and the bonding window opens again, and then she will actually nurse the accept the baby again. And I'm wondering if the music music isn't like gets like the oxytocin flowing. Help, I'm just you know. Mm-hmm. Paul's going to go amazing. all woo-woo 
But no, I I'm not going to, woo-woo I like at all. the naturalistic. I'm amazed uh, you pulled out the word ungulance so early in our conversation. <laughs> yeah, I just wrote that down, and I'm going to look it up later. I should have saved I'm mostly, that. I'm mostly amazed that I heard the word ungulant on this show. <laughs> Which an ungulants are what? They're sheep and the camels for ungulants? Yeah, like hoofed, hoofed animals. Oh, really? And a camel's a dromedary, but that's a subset of or sub whatever genus of I don't know, ungulants. man. I just spent everything I had. I take it from what you say that you're not a woo-woo person uh, in any way. Not really. I had a uh, holy roller childhood, Mm -hmm. and that kind of was enough. To turn off the woo-woo? No, I was born in Oklahoma, so I spent the first decade of my life in a tiny town in eastern Oklahoma where it was was super churchy, Mm -hmm. and that was was kind of enough. I read your book on uh, Puritans, and I Mm. loved it. It's a great book. It's wonderful. Wordy I do like other people to have, you know, implausible beliefs. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, that's where a lot of our great art and architecture comes from. Yeah. It's just um, not really in me. I mean, I did. My heart kind of skipped a beat. Um, A few weeks ago, I was in the town pump in uh, Ennis, Montana, and— the town pump, you said? The town pump. It's okay, the gas, it. it's the Montana gas <laughs> station pump. chain. Got it. That's, that's <laughs> oh, I the, get it. The town pump, I see. Okay. That's the jingle. Town Got pump. <laughs> that's good. And um <laughs> to the point. And uh Credence uh Clearwater Revival came on, um, mm-hmm. the loudspeaker. And I I did have some religious feelings about that. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I get, you know, I'm moved by things. I just think when you're dead, you're dead. Aha, uh-huh. so you're just a but strict materialist. But I can see how that philosophy doesn't really appeal to a lot of people. To a lot of people. No, and I would say that actually here, we are more interested in people's in the, in the people's beliefs than we are in actually subscribing to the beliefs ourselves. I probably have more of a tendency to buy into the woo-woo. Steve doesn't particularly at all. And so it's uh, it's there's a little bit of woo-woo here. What's more interesting is actually, yeah, I like standing outside the woo-woo and, and looking at it for the most part. Why yeah. are people into it? Yeah. Yeah. Why are people so into the things? Well, it really brings in. out the best and the worst in people, you know? Yeah. The woo woo does. Oh, yeah. I mean, as an architecture buff, it's, you know, a lot of the world's great buildings are, you know, built by woo woo people. Yeah. Right. Like, who's that? Louis Kahn and that guy? Like, he's, he was kind of a wackadoodle and, and Frank Lloyd Wright and people like that. Yeah, he had a spiritual side, but I I mean more like, you know, temples and churches uh-huh. and mm-hmm. you know, I was being more literal. No, no, no. That's that's a Do you know something that I, that 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 makes me think of? Did you know the Taj Mahal, the that beautiful tomb, which is basically a tomb. It is a tomb. It is a tomb that there was meant to be across the way from the Taj Mahal. That's that's this guy's wife's tomb. Across yeah. the way was meant to that be an identical, Taj. I, exactly, oh, really? an identical one built in black, built in oh. black marble that never got built because well, I guess that would he got be beautiful. Killed. But there's also a theory that the black Taj is just the reflection of the Taj Mahal in the water. Oh, and that's so that, black. So it's done in a sense. It was done by having the reflection be there. Yeah, which is a really lazy way to do it. <laughs> you know, and yeah. cheap, <laughs> cheap. Totally, uh, absolutely. So, you are you saying you're not in Montana right now? I I am in Montana. Why am I but coming you, up like some weirdo oh, no. know it all? I uh, no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, basically I want to have people here who are know it alls. It's kind yeah. of why we ask the people who come here mm-hmm. to come here because I like to talk to people who know a lot of shit like this. I know some. A bit all. Why? You why do you live in? Now, don't take this the wrong way, because I love Montana and I've been there twice. Mm-hmm. But why do you live in Montana? This is my hometown. This is okay. where I grew up. This is where my family lives. It's a pleasant enough place. And when I was growing up, it was a kind of magical place to grow up. Especially yeah. like when I moved here, I was eleven from this kind of medieval town in Oklahoma, uh-huh. and um, I know like. Those two places sound similar, but this is a college town. So to uh-huh. me, it was like we just moved to Paris or something. Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, there are libraries and record stores. And yeah. um, I mean, it, it's also <laughs> like it's a land grant 
university town. So there's this kind of, or there was, um, 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 sort of charming coexistence of like the pretentious and the blue collar, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like when Milan Kundera, the novelist died, I was thinking about when I was a kid in the eighties, you know, I'm like one of those Gen X latchkey kids and I would, um, just roam the streets in the middle of the night because I was always an insomniac and I would like stop in at the like greasy spoon diner in the mm-hmm. middle of the night to just, you know, have some rice pudding or read a book <laughs> sure. or do my homework or whatever. And I remember I was reading The Joke, uh-huh. the Milan K- Kundera book, uh-huh. The Joke. Uh-huh. And my waitress comes over to give me co- coffee and then she went back to her backpack and she's reading The Joke too. Yeah. Really? <laughs> so like fantastic. it was a very kind right. of, it was where even the blue collar people had yeah. pretensions of grandeur, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah, no places like that are, are, are kind of fascinating. I, I, it makes me. I've only been in Montana a couple of times, and both times I only went to Little Bighorn, and <laughs> and <laughs> both times oh, I scr- just went to Little Bighorn, and and well, I, once I was driving through, I think I stopped some somewhere, and then I went to Little Bighorn. But the next, the other time I went, I went to Wyoming because I, I I I was having kind of a bit of a midlife crisis, a mini one among many, like a cluster of midlife crises. <laughs> and one of them, I thought I should go to Montana. I didn't go to Mongolia. I thought I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to Wyoming. They're very never, similar. Yes, probably in some ways. And I thought, you know. I've never been in Wyoming, so I'm just going to go to Wyoming. And I remember um, I just go- I, I Googled Old Hotels Wyoming, and I, I was sent to this place in Buffalo, Wyoming, which is right over the, the, the border and not that far from, uh, from Little Bighorn. So I went there and stayed in this tiny little town in this great weird old hotel and would go up there, and there was a town called Sheridan, Wyoming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was really kind of and and had actually in it one of the most amazing used bookstores I've ever been in in my life, and I like to go to used bookstores and you can often find them in little towns. But there was amazing that in this little town was a woman who'd been a hospice nurse and she opened this incredible used bookstore in that town and it was truly one of the best ones I've ever been to. So it's uh, a, uh, there was new data that came out last week that uh, Montana has the most bookstores per capita. Really? In the country, because we ain't got much capita, you know. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> and that much capita, and there's a lot, a lot of. But I used to be told when I lived in Seattle that Seattle had the most bookstores of anywhere in America. But mm. which maybe there's a lot more capita there, so there's a lot more bookstores. I don't know. I, I don't know. But is there is there tension between the sort of the the literati and sort of the the other culture that I, I'm sort of associating with the West, which is like you know, stockpiling guns and hunting and uh, all of that. You know, there's sort of Republican and well, Democrat yeah. tension. Yeah, there's, there's, there's tension. I mean, it's, Montana's huge. You know, it's the, about the size of Japan. Amazing. So, like, my county, um, there, are, there we have 56 counties. I think five of them voted for Joe Biden in the last election, including mine. But, like, mine is the size of Rhode Island, you know, mm-hmm. so wow. you can be in your own little little island. But, um, I mean, the, one of the great things about growing up in the, in the state university town is everyone from all the all the ranches and reservations and all all those people from the other Montana, they come here, you know. Mm-hmm. So we do get to know each other a little bit here, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I when I was jawing on about Kandinsky, I— I was thinking about, I was picturing this guy from Roundup, Montana. And when um, when I took first year art history at Montana State and we got to Kandinsky, the slide went up. Like, you know, the cowboy is seen as this stoic archetype. Mm-hmm. But my yeah. experience of going to college with them was they just had hissy fits all the time. <laughs> really? <laughs> like, really? <laughs> yeah. Like that Kandinsky just, mm, this guy just couldn't deal with it. Which he couldn't or deal like, with it. It or blew like his mind. Or like you would show them, have you That's ever great. watched it a blew his mind in a, it, it blew his mind in a not good way. Not good way. It just way. It overwhelmed him. Okay. Yeah, or like, way. um, have you ever watched a row of guys in cowboy hats see their first German movie? <laughs> Like the expression. Well, it depends on the movie, but still, yeah. but yeah, but yeah. I'm thinking of 
<laughs> Reiner Maria Fassbender. Sure, Ryan right, yeah, tear, sure. Run amok. And like, sure. you know, boring, boring, <laughs> right. boring. And then the last five minutes, the guy murders his family. Absolutely. All the cowboy hats just like stand up. They're so <laughs> offended, you know. So, Shoot I mean, their guns. there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of parallel play, I guess you would call it. Yeah, that, that that makes me think of something. The cowboy hat thing was so interesting. How I didn't quite realize how sacred the freaking cowboy hat is until I went to Wyoming and I went to I, I drove over to uh, the hell was it called? Was it Custer, Wyoming? No, it was um, Cody. Cody, sorry, not Custer. Cody, different guy. I went to Cody and there was a kind of small family-run rodeo all summer there because I, I wanted to go to a rodeo. I'd been to a rodeo once out in Oregon, the Pendleton Roundup, which is like a famous rodeo. And so I went out there to go to that and and met the guy who ran it. It was a very nice guy, very nice fellow. And he was sort of showing me around and he said he was going to take me down into the chutes, you know, right down where mm. the guys are. And we were about to walk in there and he freaked out. <laughs> and he said, whoa, 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 you can't, you can't go in there. You don't have a hat. You don't have a hat on. <laughs> And so he ran to some other dude and got his hat and slapped this sweaty hat on my head and took me in there because I guess I was going to get my ass kicked if I walked in there without a hat on, Yeah, which I didn't realize it was that much of a thing. I mean, that's the thing, though. Like, my town, like, I grew up, uh, other than the, you know, kids from the ranches who had come here to study animal science, um, that (laughs) was just not part of my Growing up, like I had this friend from New York who was here a couple of years ago and he was taking his kids to a dude ranch and they were passing through town and he's like, where do I get these kids cowboy boots? (laughs) And I was like, uh... How should I know? I grew up playing Elizabethan music with the head of the physics department. Like, that is not part of my... Awesome. I had to Google it. Like, I don't know. There was a place. Yeah. But... yeah. Yeah. Or like, do do you guys ever have you ever seen that show Yellowstone? You know, I have not I've seen Yellowstone. I, like, seen no, I haven't seen it. I very much like to see it though. Yeah, it's very entertaining and incredibly violent, and yeah, everyone's a little too uptight about it. I think, but apparently the cowboy hats. I mean, there is something Gigantic. about that hat. Well, they're yeah. very appealing, and I guess like the Stetson Company can no longer fulfill their orders on time because that show has made people oh. want them. You know, and everybody boots. has gotten the yeah. thing. right. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, and the, is it like a is it like a not to get too sort of deep here, but it's kind of there's a semiotics of this. Like this is we're in this group, in group and out group. It's like this or no? It's just fashion. Doesn't mean anything. Well, I think it did at one time meant something. Well, I think. Um, I think it might be a signifier of masculinity. I could be wrong. I don't know. But so women don't, but, but women will wear the boots and stuff too, though, right? And don't they wear hats sometimes too? Sure. I've seen women wearing cowboy hats. Sure. You see them yeah. at the rodeo for sure. You see them all the time wearing, yeah, out yeah. there. Maybe I, but, it's a critique of modernity. I don't know. <laughs> might be. That's interesting. It could be. Could be. But I always was under the impression that literally like a 10-gallon hat was in some ways because you could literally fill it with 10 gallons of water and, and give your horse water. Was that not why they're called that? Do I, you know? I do not know. You don't know? Mm. So you came here. I invited you here. We invited you here. And you don't <laughs> this know was that. the one question. We I know had. that was basically the one thing that I had on. Uh, I had going. I can tell you the Bozeman Symphony started their season uh, last fall with Sibelius's Finlandia. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I well, like what about bears. What about ba- <laughs> bears, Sarah? We got We do have. Okay, so technically we are physically in Montana, and the bears don't really know. You know about our academic uh, programs, and they do come into town and, like, you know, try to go through our garbage cans. Uh-huh. I think there's there seems like there's a lot more bear attacks going on right now, but I just don't know whether that's bear being well, reported last or they summer, seem to be. As you know, last summer, because it was so hot, then the huckleberry uh, crop uh, was uh, substandard. There weren't, there weren't enough berries so they started coming into the towns more because they didn't have enough berries. Uh-huh. Mm. And as someone who also likes huckleberries, I also did not have enough huckleberries. <laughs> and I have some in my freezer <laughs> that I've been doling out in like tables, little tablespoon here and there over nice. the past year. 
like hoping this this summer the crop. Did you ever do, do the recoups. kind of do you do you put up the preserves and stuff in your fruit cellar and stuff I don't, like that? I don't do that. No, <laughs> you don't do that kind of thing. But I do have huckleberries in my freezer, and that's nice. You didn't yeah. get violent for a lack of huckleberries, though. I no, can't no. picture that. No, no, no. Are they grizzly or are they black bear? And have you ever? They're run just in, black had bears. Black They're bears. Just black bears. We don't have grizzlies in town. I do have actually like some actual a question that I wanted okay. to ask you, mm-hmm. and and it's because like you prepped this ahead of time. This one I well I didn't <laughs> like you prep actually it ahead did of some time. Work. <laughs> I didn't know I didn't prep it ahead of time. Oh, okay. But I was thinking about well I guess I did. I was thinking about it only because. Uh, being a, 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 a particular fan of the book uh, Assassination Vacation that you wrote about the assassination stuff. And one of the things I particularly liked about it and like about that, that one is, is your sort of appreciation for all the kind of like weird, s- secondary, tertiary, fourth-rate people in, in history of mm-hmm. which, you know, some of the guys in that thing, like the guy who shoots Gar- Garfield and the guy who shoots McKinley and stuff like that. But uh, and your appreciation of the of the people who appreciate this stuff too, and the sort of like I have a similar thing, and and but I'm also very interested in presidential history. And recently, a little while ago, I had the great pleasure of going to the Millard Fillmore House. Have you been mm. there in Aurora, New York? I have not. Yeah, and it's quite something, and I definitely recommend it. And it's pretty amazing. And there's a local bunch of locals will give you tours and fascinating stuff. But it but. I do have this particular fascination with the kind of the particular like not loser presidents, just the guys we don't care about. And most of them actually seem like that. I mean, like 97 percent of them are guys that we don't really particularly. But I really do sometimes wonder which one of these guys is the least sexy one. Who's the president <laughs> you think is the least sexy? And not, but, but I, because for me, what's tricky is you go Millard Fillmore. You say, but I'm like, yeah, but Millard Fillmore, it's funny because he's Millard Fillmore. His name's Millard Fillmore, all these things. But who is the guy who really rates absolutely not even mockery or anything like this? Who is the guy? Because I know. Millard Fillmore has actually been in the news the last few years because, so I guess every, like, is Aurora near Buffalo? Yes, it's not too yeah. far from Buffalo. So yeah. I guess everything in Buffalo is named after him. And because <laughs> everyone was proud, like we got this president. But then, you know, he's the president um, oh, what did who he do? signed the um, oh, uh, he... Compromise of 1850, which me, which included yes. the Fugitive Slave Law. Right. So a lot of, so some of the people in the town are all, you know, still Millard boosters. And then uh-huh. some people want to uh-huh. like rename everything. Yes. And in fact, I think that I was aware of that while I was there. And that's what I mean. It's like he did something significant, yeah. negatively significant, but he did something. And it's like, where, which one of these guys absolutely rates nothing? Which one of these guys is nobody? Basically, right. I know who I a think cipher. it is. Yeah. Who's just a complete cipher. Because Coolidge. you look at it and you go, Cool to see, but Coolidge is funny because he's silent Cal and he feeds the cat at the table while everybody, and it's like kind of funny because he's, <laughs> so, he's such a, he feeds he's the such cat. a, I mean, wasn't he always feeding his cat? He was always, he was always feeding his cat. There aren't that many presidents at all. You right. Know? Yeah. 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 But and, I will tell you that the guy that mystifies me the most, and I don't know if you know anything about him, and I, it's almost the extent that I want to do something about him, is Benjamin Harrison. Hmm. And he, to me, seems like the guy that nobody knows anything about him. William was Harrison, he the one who died? Like William Harrison's the guy who gave his speech, yeah. caught a cold, and died. Got pneumonia and died. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Zachary Taylor's the guy who ate the bowl of ice cream too fast, or he ate something. And, he and had the some, cherries. Yes, he had cherries or something killed and him. And milk. Like that. Milk, yes. cherries, right. Ice cold cherries and milk or something, and it gave him a rupture of some kind. But Benjamin Harrison is the guy that I know nothing about and seems to have done absolutely nothing but be a guy who came between I don't even know who. He, I don't even know where he, he comes in. He opened in. Uh, Ellis Island. I know that. That's all I know about him. Well, now you just, there you go. So maybe there isn't like a total <laughs> zero president because that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they, there can't be such a thing. So they, you know, like, I guess that's the thing about history is maybe they didn't tell the story. But yeah, but everybody's significant, but the story just didn't get told or was forgotten or something. Well, in that assassination book, I just do the first three assassinations. Yes. Yes. Or as my um, publisher put it, uh, not the one everyone cares about. (laughs) Yes. JFK. 
Yes. <laughs> like what? Yes. I mean, if you want to do a project and you have to, I don't know, sell it in a capitalist marketplace, you need at least animosity generally. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like, you know, like I had to, I read a book about the Puritans and I had to sell that and I found out people hate them. Uh-huh. But they will I love the hate, Puritans. But they will hate but, yeah. read a book about them. Some people will, you know. Mm-hmm. Hate them because of the legacy of just like like uptight craziness yeah. and burning mm-hmm. witches and stuff the like Salem. that. Salem, yeah. Uh huh. Right. So it's all Sa- of that. I stuff. guess. Yeah. 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 So I mean, I mean, you've already have you played? I know you played one president. Have you played mm-hmm. more than one president? I played. I played one president on screen. I played Adams. Yeah. Who I would have at some. Well, I never would have rated him a zero because of everything he did when he wasn't president. And but um, I then did. Roosevelt. I did Theodore Roosevelt. Oh, that's right. You were the I did voice, a voice in for Ken in Burns's Ken thing. Burns' thing. Oh, so I did those okay. two pretty different, well, I don't know, fiery personalities, but guys who were, one guy yeah. was a terrible president, and the other one who was arguably a good one, I suppose, and did some terrible things, I guess. But but everybody comes in for revision at some point. I have a soft spot point. for Adams. Don't, you don't have a soft I spot do. for I do. No, no, him. no. Now I do. Yeah, now I do. I didn't know anything about him. But I really liked, I used to really like Roosevelt. Mm. And to like you know, he was kind of a psychopath in some ways, but there were other ways in which he seemed pretty, pretty good. Yeah, actually. I mean, yeah. If, I mean, yeah, warmonger, yeah. racist, imperialist. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But <laughs> meat, meat <laughs> That's inspection. <a> <laughs> That's right. Meat inspection, trust meat busting, inspection. all that stuff. Yeah, That's yeah. not bad. No, he did some stuff. That, I mean, but, also the whole state of Montana would probably be a pit mine without him. You know. <laughs> That's Uh-oh. true too. But it, it probably it, it's probably in danger of becoming a pit mine. Did he protect uh, lands or something? Well, is that, yeah. I mean, the one the thing about him is it's like all the guys who want to turn the whole West into a pit mine, for whatever reason, he's their hero, and it nags at them. Oh. You know, like it yeah. keeps them from doing right. their worst. And you know, his general, like you know, being the first president that like calls people to the White House is like to talk about conservation and like we need to um we need to slow our roll a little bit like yeah. all that stuff that was pretty important yeah i'm not diminishing his you know no uh, but he was a, he was definitely kind of a psycho i know that uh, mark twain was like the guy's insane and should yeah, be he hated him because he's he out of his him. mind you know, all the imperialist insanity and stuff like that i think didn't go over well big reader big reader Fast reader, big reader. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. I read a and book a day a or something like that. <laughs> and he could take a bullet too. He could totally take a bullet. But it's interesting to me just that everybody comes in for you like know, revision. People don't use that as a judge of character anymore. Taking a bullet. To come back. Yeah. Take yeah. A bullet. <laughs> you can yeah. actually take, you could you could absorb a bullet. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, yeah. I suppose so. I guess so. Reagan could yeah. take I'd a bullet a too, speech. evidently. <laughs> Ray, yeah. Reagan could do it too. Um, but I'm interested to see the people like Chester Arthur are getting like revision now. Like there was a biography of him and people are now like, not such a bad president. And I'm like, really? Like, and then it feels like you're really reaching and having to search for a guy to see if it I mean, looks I don't so. mind that so much. It's like the opposite, which seems to be more of the like tenor of like extremely contemporary history where it's uh-huh. just like, let's tear everybody down uh-huh. because uh-huh. they do not meet my moral standards, uh-huh. you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was um, speaking at MIT a few years ago, not that long ago, and um, I was talking about George Washington, and I was talking about George Washington's letter to the synagogue at Newport about mm. the Bill of Rights, and it's this beautiful letter where, so the synagogue at Newport, which had, you know, I think the oldest um, Jewish congregation in um, in America uh, because of, you know, Puritan Roger Williams inviting like all the, all the miscreants to come to Rhode mm-hmm. Island. Mm-hmm. Um, not because he was open-minded, but because he thought they would burn in hell forever and that would be punishment enough. <laughs> <laughs> so like Jews and Quakers and, you know, all, like various, you know, radicals come to Rhode Island. So by the time of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, Rhode Island has had de facto religious freedom for more than a century. Mm-hmm. So the synagogue at Newport writes Washington a letter asking about, you know, is this Bill of Rights thing good for the Jews, basically. Mm-hmm. I'm paraphrasing. But, um, and he writes this beautiful letter back saying, like, 
you know, we're equal now. Like there's no such thing as tolerance or I believe the word is as it's toleration, like meaning one group does not tolerate another. We're all equal under this right. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, it's a pretty major moment in the history of civil rights in the world, basically. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm, you know, on stage talking about this and uh, there's like, wailing coming from the audience and um someone in the audience is weeping Mm -hmm. and so i stopped talking to make sure this person doesn't need medical attention because you know what happens i give a talk and someone has a seizure (laughs) but she she she's crying and it's really loud and it's very performative you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um and i'm like what's what's the matter do you need help (laughs) and she said um It's just too painful for me to hear something nice being said about a slave owner. Oh, here we go. Yeah. And that was like the first one of these experiences I had. So I wasn't, I didn't know. I don't think I handled it very well. I was just, I I don't know. But uh, like I'm supposed to go back in time and make George Washington also an Mm anti-Semite. You know, like it's (laughs) like we all know he's, you know, not a perfect figure. But he did do some stuff that's worth pondering. Mm-hmm. And um, like just the, I don't know, childishness of that response mm-hmm. kind of weighed on me, I guess. I got to deal with this on a regular basis too in, in, uh, as a college professor because yeah. it's become a kind of posture that, that people uh, – and it's tricky to how, how to deal with it because um, – what they want you to do is just get angry and and uh, and sort of take the bait. And uh, I was talking to a group about um, horror, and and H.P. Lovecraft came up, and I I was saying, you know, he he really is this very important character as a, in terms of his influence and his own writing, and and somebody like got very upset and sort yeah, of stood up and said he was a racist, yeah, 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 and, yeah, he's, yeah. and I was like, yeah, of course. So anyway, back to his writing. And they were, mm-hmm. it's sort of like, it just diffused it right away because he wanted me to go, oh no, you know. But it's hard to, because everybody expects history to live up to our current moral code and it isn't going to happen. Which is weird. Don't it's you think, like, though, like studying the arts and the history of the arts helps with that because all yeah. artists are, you know, ne'er do well, drunk, drug addict, <laughs> philanderers, like, yeah. and, and, um, you know, you just kind of have to like get used to it. Yeah. Like, I suppose so. But people definitely have an issue with those, with all those yeah, guys too. And that's problematic too. So it makes that very difficult to do too. I mean, you can't really teach about Picasso I mean, particularly right now, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's vexed. It's tricky. It's like, it's not easy. Like Gauguin was a Gauguin was a horrible person. And, horrible you know, person. Great like, painter. Horrible, horrible person. person. Yeah. He really. You don't want to have lunch with him. No, but he, for sure. You, he knew gonna, what to do with yellow. But it makes the writing of history really confusing. I would. Th- I mean, it's like to me at least. It's like I don't know. It, it almost feels like as a discipline. I don't know what the hell you do in it now, because it's just. It, it feels like it's impossible to work yeah. in, in that field now. I mean, how can you do anything in it? And then you just, but to me, it's just, it makes me wonder what it was even in the first place and what its use is and 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 what its purpose is in some way, because it's so, it's so. You, you mean the writing now. of history? That's what Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. but also just the teaching of it and the use of it and stuff like that. It starts to make me wonder what it's for and what it is and how you write it or how, what we do with it at all, which are big, stupid questions probably, but it's like, but they're confusing to me. Oh, yep. There you go, Steve. That was awesome. I hit I hit him with the I hit him with the big stupid question, Steve. That's what I do. <laughs> well, that's what we do that's here what on I the do. show. In the tradition of Edward R. Murrow and the great <laughs> journalists of the past, hit him with the biggest, stupidest possible question, Steve. Well, it just disarms them and then it creates an opportunity for them to reach in and find things that they never knew were, were within them. That's the point. <laughs> That's the challenge point. them with the <laughs> challenge them with the big dumb ones. That's right. absolutely. But I'm telling you, I am. But it's a big question I have. You know, these these are the questions that keep me up at night. What is history? No, it is. What is it? Yes. What's the purpose to it? I don't. You know, I don't. I it, it keeps me up at night. No, it's among true. other questions too. 
Like, you know, should I have eaten that? Uh, should I have had that cannoli? <laughs> should I should have I had that second cannoli? The whole stromboli. Should I have had <laughs> the whole stromboli. But this is the kind of thing that, that keeps me up at night. And uh, it's the questions I want to know the answer to, including also, uh, by the way, the question of why is it called a 10-gallon hat? Maybe yes. not as big a question, but but I am Weird. interested, and that's something that if folks our know, listeners will know. I why? think uh, some of our listeners will know this. They're, they're masters of Definitely. obscure <laughs> trivia, and uh, so yeah. please send it yeah. send it it's, in and and talk to us. Absolutely, send it in to us, uh, and and we'll we'll get on that. Uh, you can actually send us in comments and things uh, to questions at chinwagpod.fm or any other venue, any number of other venues that we're on. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can, you can find us an answer, hopefully answer that question for us. Well, we had we had so much to talk to uh, Sarah Vowell about, the great Sarah Vowell, and that we'll have the rest of that chat for you sometime soon. There will be That's a right. part duh. Yeah, and she's uh, fascinating. And you also get a glimpse into, you know, Montana and parts of the country that mm-hmm. you don't really hear a- enough about. And mm-hmm. she's just got a mm-hmm. great take on on the, the whole nation does. and Hawaii too. Fantastic. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, she's awesome. So uh, there you go. Review us on Apple Podcasts, uh, please. Uh, leave us ratings and uh, tell us why they call the 10-gallon hat. Please. Yes, please. Somebody. Because I'm dying to know so I can sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> that's it for us from Chinwag Central. Chinwag. Wag on weirdos. Wag on weirdos. See ya. Chinwag is a production of Treefort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Treefort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Our associate producer is Andrew Miller. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardo. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Treefort. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Audio production, supervision, and editing by Maxwell Carney. Additional audio assistance and mixing by Jeff Neal. With additional production management from Renee Levesque. Clara Wong is Celestial Empress of Benevolent Knowledge. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod.